Sad, sad news on the Husker front. So we hate to deliver this if you're not aware, but uh, we will, uh, of course, um, honor Cole Pensick uh, for the next hour and certainly honor him and uh, dedicate this show to his memory. But we're here at Huskers Live, as we always are, every Tuesday, 7 o'clock Eastern Time, 6 Central. Greg Peterson's right here on the line with us, as always. And check out his work, Husker Online, right here on YouTube. Greg, how are you doing tonight? Uh, You know, tired as usual after a long day at practice and work. But, uh, you know, we're excited to to talk Huskers. Were you back from Nashville at the time that Cole Pensick was playing, which he was a second team, all big 10 performer on the offensive line in 2013. Yeah, absolutely. I was around uh, for his entire career at Nebraska and, uh, you know, he was a Lincoln Northeast grad and um, kind of, he's the last Lincoln Northeast player that's uh, ever received a scholarship from Nebraska. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a sad Sad loss. Uh, you know, he lost his life in a car accident uh, Sunday or Saturday night, Sunday morning uh, in the Omaha area. And yeah, it was, a, it was kind of a shock to hear about that. Another, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's the second. I mean, there's another former uh, Mark Pellini, former offensive lineman at Nebraska, no relation to Bo, but played for Bo. And um, he also lost his life in a car accident uh, a couple years ago. So, you know, these big, strong offensive linemen are not indestructible. Yeah, Cole Pensick, uh, 32. Greg uh, let us know it was in a one-car uh, vehicle accident. And uh, certainly our, our sympathies go out and our condolences, thoughts and prayers out to his family and friends and close friends. And uh, the Husker family, of course, made various statements out. So. Uh, we will honor him with the, the remainder of the show here. Cole Pensick, um, fine player, second team all Big Ten in that 2013 season for a Nebraska football team that uh, was one of the top rushing teams in the Big Ten that year. All right, Greg, you made it out to practice today. What's the good word out there these days? Uh, you know, I mean, I guess I was back to work as usual after, uh, you know, four days off to enjoy Easter and um, you know I coach rule was happy with the retention and you know you know he, he wanted to make sure that uh, while they had you know a few days off to you know keep on studying the playbook and everything and they went out there with with really good enthusiasm and it was a it was a good practice uh, to everybody that talked about it uh, said they had had a really good practice and I think that, you know, it, it really seems like like uh, the players are having a lot of fun at practice. Um, when you talk to some of the guys that have been around before, they're just, you know, it's a lot more fun for them. And I think that's a big deal that, uh, you know, you kind of forget, uh, especially when you're losing football games all the time. Um, it's not fun. So, uh, yeah, I think this new coaching staff has uh, really captured – the hearts and minds of all these players. Talking Huskers here, bring those uh, comments and questions there. Drop them in the live chat. We're here every Tuesday with Greg. Check out his work on Husker Online right here on YouTube. And again, comments and questions are welcome as we take it on through spring practice. I've probably asked you this about 14 times and I can just Google it, but (laughs) the Nebraska spring game, is it this Saturday or the next Saturday? Next Saturday, the 22nd. Yeah, yeah. Got it. All right. <laughs> On the 22nd. Okay. And yeah, Coach Rule was asked about if uh, today that if he had had, you know, any thoughts on, on a format for it. And Coach Rule wants to play a game. Um, you know, these, these always depend on availability as well. Um, but yeah, he wants to have, he wants to have a game and, and you know, make sure that it's competitive. And as far as he knows right now, the quarterbacks will be live in the spring game, which is a, uh, you haven't seen for quite a while around here. So uh, yeah, he, he wants a real competitive football game. And if numbers allow that, then that's what they're going to do. Well, it's always a, uh, 
tough call for a head coach to make because, hey, it's a physical game. It's a collision sport, uh, not necessarily a contact sport. And to get these guys prepared and ready to be sharp, to be able to hit and tackle effectively on an opening game, you got to practice it. At the same time, you try to tote that fine line and keep them healthy. Yep, absolutely. So I'm not recalling which quarterbacks are in play this spring. Well, you had, you know, you got Jeff Sims and Heinrich Harburg and um, Chubba Purdy. Casey Thompson's the only one not playing, correct? And, and Logan Smothers, yeah. And Logan Smothers. Those two, yeah, yeah. And Richard, Richard Torres as well, so. And they'll all get, they'll all get reps. Obviously, they'll all probably get about the same amount of reps, I would imagine, because uh, that's what they get in practice right now. Yeah, that's uh, that's a fascinating uh, situation there, because this is probably the best quarterback competition we see out of anybody in the Big Ten. Uh, most of the other schools, most of the other jobs are buttoned up. Everyone that I can think of outside of Ohio State, but they pretty much know that Kyle McCord's going to be the guy. This is about, this is the best, like where it's almost 50, 50. Uh, yeah. You know, Jeff Sims comes in as a guy that's proven. Mm -hmm. So you, you've at got the power five level. You've got four guys that have started games at the power five level in college already in your room. So that's, that, that's pretty rare. Absolutely. Uh, bone led corn fed is asking me, did I have a sub? Did you have a sub doing your shows? Oh, a substitute doing my shows. I thought he thought I was eating on the side or something. Okay. I, I got you. Uh, never mind me once a game, you know, even, even if they tackle, uh, you know, oh, it's going to tackle. Oh yeah. It's still not going to be anything to behold per se, but Hey, it's I'm counting on the big 10 network to give me a TV show, meaning to tell me about, uh, about these teams, things that I don't know to give me a really good preview of the team and not just show me a, a practice. And, and they usually deliver. So I'm, I'm glad about that. Well, I mean, the nice thing about it is that, you know, there's not really, you don't have like the secretive things going on that like you did with the old staff. Um, you know, they're not hiding anything and, you know, they tell you exactly what they do during practice as far as tackling and, and you know, being live and all that. So, and it's, you know, obviously they're doing a lot more of that than the previous staff was. Bonelead corn fed. I have not been to a Nebraska football game. I would love to go to a Nebraska football game. If the circumstances work out in such a way, I would definitely love the experience. Would love the experience. Bucket list. I would like to, uh, you know, as it relates to college football, you know, Nebraska, yeah, would be on the short list. I would also like to go to the Rose Bowl. I would like to go to a Rose Bowl game, but if I can't do that, I'll take a UCLA game at the Rose Bowl. Yep. A damn beast media. He's a Georgia guy. How do the corn dogs do the corn dogs? He's called Nebraska the corn dogs. I thought somebody else went by that kind of like a <laughs> nickname of sorts. I didn't think that was Nebraska, but it makes sense. Okay. Corn dogs look so far. Will Eric Gilbert get his exception and be available this year? Yeah, you know, Matt Rule was asked about that, and he does not know. Um, you know, he, he doesn't have anything to do with that. But um, you know, he believes he should get it. But, uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, he's 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 practicing like he is going to get it. And, um, you know, if the NCAA has any uh, any heart, then, uh, then they'll give it to him. But um, well, he's a great-looking player. That's for darn sure. Um He's a specimen, and, and they know that down in Georgia. 
<laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. You took the words right out of my mouth. He's a specimen. Yeah. And, and you know what's what's kind of cool is that he'll he'll pop into the wide receiver meetings and uh, grab himself a snack and uh, sit down and, and start, uh, you know, getting involved in the wide receiver meetings and stuff too. Um, that's kind of the way this whole team is that uh, the versatility that you see, they all want to, they all want to learn different roles and stuff because the staff is their number one, you know, goal is to prepare these guys for NFL football. And they have a lot of experience in the NFL as a whole. And you kind of see how the, the kids gravitate towards uh, what they're trying to teach them. And, you know, Eric is uh, right there with them. You know, he's definitely, you know, ever since he came out of high school, he's always been kind of tabbed as, uh, you know, that kind of guy that's, a, 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 you know, a no miss for the NFL. And um, it'd be nice to, uh, you know, see him uh, get a full year in, you know, playing a lot of football. And uh, hopefully he does, he does get that exception and is eligible to play. Does Matt Rule call him Eric? Yeah, he does. Uh, because, yeah, at some point uh, when he came out, when he first uh, hit the scene, you know, I just called him Eric. I heard everybody call him Eric. And then at some point, yeah, I heard him make it uh, definitive that he's yeah, that Eric. Was, yeah, that was Thursday when, when he spoke at his press conference. It was the first time I'd ever heard it said Eric. And uh, so that's that's what everybody's calling him now. <laughs> Does Matt Rule have any idea when this exception decision is going to be no. announced? No, no, not a clue. Hmm. Not a clue. Bonelead Corn Fed wants to know your assessment of how recruiting is going for the 2024 class. Well, it, you already got two two commits, both from Texas and pretty darn good players. And um, there will be another commit tomorrow. I, I can't uh, say who, but it is a, it's a local player. So that that'll be made uh, that'll made pub that'll be made public tomorrow. So yeah, it, the class is it's going along great, and you know they've had a lot of kids in, and and they will continue to do that. And obviously, you know, on the twenty second, it'll be huge for uh, you know having official visitors in for the spring game. So I would expect to uh, see you know some more commitments here in the next couple of weeks, or you know following the spring game. So most of us are going to evaluate this class based on the number next to the class, based on the yeah, various based the on the way. various services. It kind of always is. Yeah. Sure, <laughs> but for you, you've been in this game a long time. How much further are you going to go past that? What what is going to be the indicators for you that that this was successful? Well, I just I want to see it you know, keep building on, on what they finished off with last year. And, uh, I mean, obviously we all know who the big fish would be that, uh, would, would make all the difference in the world. Um, but you know, we don't know if that's going to happen or not, but, uh, obviously, you know, you, if you don't get that, that number one quarterback out there, uh, you know, you have a plan B and a plan C and, and, you know, you're obviously going to take one quarterback no matter what. Um, and then, you know, I think they always – they cover – they covet all these big-bodied, fast, athletic guys that you can plug in at different positions. And you kind of see that's the way they like to recruit. So you're going to bring those guys – those type of guys in. And, and I think, obviously, you need to get uh, some more bodies in that offensive line room and, and the defensive line room as well. Um, so – you know, you'll have to see how it is in the hole. And, you know, if it's a top 20 recruiting class, I think it's successful. And if it's higher, that's even, uh, that's even better. I mean, we can, we know Matt rule can, if he can win some games, we know that he's a pretty darn good recruiter and, you know, that could turn that class into a top 15 type class, but we'll see. Folks, we can benefit uh, you as a sponsor. We would like to tell you how. Please hit me up at Mark Rogers TV at Gmail. We'll let you know uh, what we can provide for you as a sponsor of the channel of the show right here with Greg each and every Tuesday. So uh, hit me up at Mark Rogers TV at Gmail, whether you want to personally sponsor the show or uh, you have a uh, organization, company, uh, business, 
that you're in contact with or own yourself, hit me up, Mark Rogers TV at Gmail. Asawar wants to know uh, what the expectations are for Thomas Fedone. Well, you know, you want to see him finally get a chance to play college football after two years of uh, on the shelf. Um, you know, if you watched him play in high school, you know, he's a tremendous talent. He was the number one tight end in the country coming out that year. And um, you want to be able to see, you know, you want to want to see what you used to see when he was before he got hurt. Um, and if you got if you got Eric Gilbert alongside eligible, you got a pretty darn good one two punch at, at tight end. So, you know, if those two guys are both eligible and healthy, that's going to be a battle to watch. And, and, you know, like we've kind of talked about before, they're going to play a lot of guys at every position anyway, because that's what they like to do. Um, they like to keep guys fresh. And, uh, but yeah, you know, if you can get Thomas Fanoni back, you know, going and, and, you know, getting in the rhythm and catching the ball and taking contact and, and, you know, watching him at practice is that, that he's a hundred percent full go. Um, Matt rule has kind of, he's gotten tired of trying to limit him because he fights him on it all the time. And, uh, he's, he's out there, he's out there doing special teams and he's tenacious out there. You can just tell he's chomping at the bit to, uh, you know, actually play some real football. So yeah, we'll see, uh, We'll see if he gets unleashed here uh, <laughs> on the 22nd, uh, which that could give you a, a really good, uh, you know, uh, preview of what he can do during the regular season, you know, if he's if he's available. A lot of people would like to see MJ Sherman show what he's capable of doing after uh, spending a couple of years with the national champions. And, of course, uh, he's – in camp and ready to roll. Have you heard anything out of uh, MJ Sherman? Oh yeah, he's an impressive young man, uh, very mature, and and he is he wants to be a part of turning this program around. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, you know, he's been around uh, national championships, and um, you know, he's a heck of a football player and. Um, you know, he's gonna, he's Mr. Versatility. Like, I know we keep bringing up that word, but, um, you know, he's going to go down there. He's going to put his hand down on the ground and rush the quarterback at, at certain times too. Um, but he can do everything at that linebacker spot. So, uh, um, he's very proud and he can't wait to, to go out and show what he can do. Uh, you know, wearing wearing the Husker red. We are here every Tuesday with Greg. We appreciate uh, Greg showing up every Tuesday for us to deliver uh, Nebraska football analysis. Uh, please leave your comments and questions there in the live chat. Bring a friend or two or 50 with you. And, of course, for whatever you miss here, you can just um, catch the record. So if you show up a few minutes late, no worries there. Just uh, catch the record. Our USC guy, Tim, who hosts uh, with uh, Rick. Rick and Tim on our USC channel every Sunday night. Tim's a good guy. An amazing job out of him. Says hi to Greg and I. Tim, hi, Tim. good to see you. Maybe uh, I think Tim would like to see, if I'm not mistaken, Tim would like to see a Nebraska-USC uh, hookup in regards to those permanent opponents. I think we all would love to see that. I think that. you want to see that, too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you've got your fans, though, Greg, that want to see the easiest games possible because they want the record to be as good as possible. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not one of those. Nebraska fans would never pass up a, a trip out to Southern California uh, for a weekend, for a football weekend. But if you play them every year, that's going to be every other year. All right, right, okay. right. Uh, no, you know, we're – you know, you don't want to. You don't want to play the the little cupcakes, and you know, I mean, you want to play. You got to pay. Um, I, I love I love playing good teams way more than than bad teams. Come on. <laughs> All right, Moonbot wants USC, UCLA, and Iowa. I'd take that. That means you would get to go out to LA every year. <laughs> <laughs> every year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Get to play in the Rose Bowl every other year. That'd yeah. be cool. 
I've never been to the Rose Bowl, so yeah, that that would be neat. <clears throat> Yeah, Tim says, uh, I loved the Husker fans when they came out to L.A. Of course, uh, that was a holiday bowl game against, uh, no, that was a Foster uh, Farms bowl game against, uh, that was both. That was no, a Foster Farms bowl game he's against talking, UCLA. He's talking about the, the, the home and home that they played uh, back in the, uh, what, 2012 or something like that? Or no, not that, earlier than that, about 2009? Yeah, I, I'm only going back about seven or eight years. <laughs> they played UCLA in a bowl game. I was at that game as a fan. In USC. I was, I was out covering, uh, I think I was covering the uh, USC Rising Stars camp, and I stayed an extra day and went to the Nebraska-USC game. So, so yeah, Tim's talking about the home and home. Yep. yep. Whenever that was. Pete Carroll, Pete Carroll teams. Bill Callahan versus Pete Carroll. <laughs> That's when I, got, got, uh, I, got, I got accused of, because uh, I was going to go meet a friend of mine. Um, he said, just meet me at, at uh, Tommy Trojan. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't even know where that is. And so I asked some USC fans uh, where Tommy Trojan was. And they said, why? What are you going to do to him? <laughs> you know, because I was wearing Husker gear. <laughs> all right just because i need to know anytime i see something like that and i don't remember off the top of my head i gotta go look it up so yeah 2007 at nebraska there you go 4931 usc and then 2006 at usc 2810 usc okay 0607 all right then they played in a bowl game about seven or eight years ago. S. Spray, what is your assessment of the strongest areas of the defense at this point? Obviously, I think the secondary. You have a lot of returning talent there and and some nice uh, new additions as well. And I like what the linebacker room looks like as well. You know, the linebackers and the edge guys, I, I think, are going to be pretty good. And, um you know, as long as you can develop some of these interior guys, then uh, I think it's going to be a pretty solid unit. So, yeah, I just, you know, I just kind of have to go right now where the most veteran guys are at to uh, to say what the strongest point would be without without seeing anything live ourselves, you know. But um, we'll see. I mean, it sounds like, the you know, when the defense does get unleashed, they've been doing pretty good. Joel, the uh... – format for the scheduling has not been announced but it's pretty much determined and been talked about and announced and kevin warren pretty much came out and said it not that he's going to be the commissioner going forward but uh that there will be no divisions again not officially it's not officially been announced or the scheduling format but uh we're believing no divisions and we're believing a 366 scheduling format meaning that every team in the big 10 is going to play three teams every year permanently and then they split up the rest of the conference six and six, and you just alternate between those two groups of teams. So what's really good about that is you don't have this uh, gap of not seeing a team for three, four, five years at a time. You get to see everybody at least once every other year. It's about the best way you can do it. Otherwise, yeah. it doesn't seem like a conference if you don't get to play everybody, you know, like you said, every in five years or something. Yeah, I think that's about the best way they can do it. Now, the the tricky part is figuring out the rivalries are pretty evident. But beyond that, um, how much do you make it difficult on your best programs? Because that's what the TV networks want. They want Ohio State and Nebraska and Michigan and USC always to be playing each other because they're going to get the best numbers, which reminds me, Greg, I'm doing a series on TV ratings. And maybe <laughs> once we get through spring practice, I'll show you some of those numbers and we'll talk about Nebraska's TV ratings because she might imagine, despite winning only four games, they're mighty impressive for a team that only won four games. But, you know, the networks won and the conference is going to make the most money if the best teams are playing each other all the time. 
but that's not fair. <clears throat> and it doesn't set up your best teams for success if they're having to tack on all those losses either. Yeah. This is a difficult, it's a difficult thing to think about, you know, when you're trying to set this all up and, you know, television networks are, you know, throwing so much money at it and, and basically are trying to control, you know, they're going to try to control the, the scheduling. So, um, yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll work it out. I know they'll work it out the best way they possibly can. And I mean, obviously, you know, USC and UCLA already know that they're going to have to travel, <laughs> you know, a, a long way uh, just to play any conference game. Um, so I don't know, you know, having them, you know, we'll, we'll see how many times they say they they pit a USC or UCLA against, say, Rutgers or Penn State, you know. Because um, that, you know, it's just it's so hard to, to travel across the country that many times, you know, for a college program. It, it gets pretty expensive. Got our buddy John showing up from Coronation. John, how you doing tonight? Well, it's it's spring in Minnesota. It's almost eighty degrees. The ice is cleared off my back patio. Is that spring or summer? <laughs> well, it's you know it's springy and then it's going to go back to forty and okay, you know it th yeah. it's hope in the air. That's what it is. It's the hope it of sure uh, like fishing season's coming. The Nebraska spring game is coming. Uh, you know, and then it'll go too quick and fall be here. The last two days in Ohio here have been, I cannot ask for a better day than 78 degrees and sunny without a cloud in the sky. Yeah, absolutely. 85 uh, here, 87 here. 87? Yeah. Eight, down You're, to 82 now. <laughs> are, you, are you in Lincoln? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Sometimes I wish I'd miss I'd move back there, but it it, it isn't in the cards. <laughs> it's a great little town, you know. I I think of all the things I miss in Lincoln, uh, and honestly, I miss the zoo bar more than anything else. And Lincoln and Omaha are how close? It's Forty-five like an hour? minutes. Forty-five minutes. So I've never been to Lincoln. Miles. I've been to Omaha a couple times for the College World Series. Getting closer and closer every day. Oh yeah, as they build out. Yeah, I mean they're actually they're they're building a, a big uh, like uh, resort type lake with a port authority for trucking. Um, about halfway between Lincoln and Omaha, it's going to attract a bunch of businesses and big recreational area and stuff. So. It's really going to start getting a lot closer here in the next few years. Wow. Will that, will that make it harder for people from Omaha to get to 11 o'clock games? Ew. <laughs> There'll just be a turnoff on the interstate for, for, you know, a new exit is all. So, <laughs> John, we're kicking around uh, what teams could be playing Nebraska's permanent opponents. Who do you want? Oh, well, the quadrangle I hate, which is, what is it? It's Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Northwestern. I mean, well. I, I mean, listen, when, you know, I'm old. I grew up with the Big 8, then we got the Big 12, and then we got all of our rivalries shattered, you know. So I'm not really attached to anything except for uh, I hate Iowa, and <laughs> I live it. I live in Minnesota and I really, <laughs> yeah. Who likes Iowa? No I one. I don't know anybody. That <laughs> yeah. Uh, I live in Minnesota. So of course I want them to play, you know, Minnesota. So I get to go to home games here and I want to beat Minnesota in every sport we play them in. Northwestern just seems like they have had a decent rivalry with us. They're the other in you. Uh, our debate, the Nebraska debate team wins the Big Ten all the time and crushes Northwestern in that. And uh, who am I forgetting here? Wisconsin. I mean, Wisconsin's – I've worked a lot in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin is a state full of the happiest people in the nation. 
you don't want to see uh, either California team every year. Uh, I think it'd be good for recruiting. I mean, it'd be fun. You know, I remember the, oh, come on. I want to say 1983 UCLA, but that's not oh. it. 14 to 13, Tommy Fraser. Tommy Fraser. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was 1993 a... and uh, Terry Donahue, I think it was. But I, I, I would like to see us play, I guess. You could throw Northwest. Nobody wants to play Northwestern every year, do they? Uh, nobody does want to play Northwestern, <laughs> but they got to play somebody. So uh, Illinois yeah. is going to get stuck with them. We know that. Yeah. Right. Uh... <laughs> Never I, mind I could me. Take... Yep. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, never mind me, is uh, asking how will those California teams do in the latter part of the season with the weather in the Big Ten? I'll serve that up to uh, Greg first and then you, John, and then I've got my my um, angle on this one. Well, you know, heck, from being from here and having to cover those games in the cold, I hate it. So how can they like it when they come from the California weather? Um, it definitely is going to affect them. Um, obviously, they'll they'll try to prepare every way possible. But you know, quite frankly, they're not used to playing in the cold weather in late season games. You know, especially conference games. So I think it will be a factor, definitely, for all the teams that are used to the cold weather. I mean, that's what and you hear that all the newcomers, you know, any transfers or any recruits that uh, are from out of state, you know, you ask them, uh, how, how's it been, you know, getting, getting used to Lincoln. And so, you know, the number one, number one answer is always uh, just trying to get used to the cold. Um, it takes a while for California guys or Florida guys or Georgia guys or Texas guys to get used to the, to the cold like it is. I guess, I guess you'd wonder if uh, Lincoln Riley is going to change, like, you know, Lincoln Riley, I guess USA is going to change up his offense at least a little because he's going to join the Big Ten. I mean, you always get this stuff about it's hard to throw the ball in November, but then Green Bay, you know, they do it all the time, but they're pros. So I wonder if we're going to see any of that. I, I, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't think it's any harder to throw the ball. I mean, you've seen almost everybody be able to overcome that. So, no, I just think it's just a, a comfort level. And I don't know if he's, you know, I mean, he, it's hard to say what he'll do. I mean, because he, you know, he, he's used to playing, you know, Big 12 now, you know, Pac 12 for a little bit. And um, I think he, his offense has been pretty similar at both places. So I don't know. We'll see. I mean, obviously, it's a different league that, you know, you, you need to be able to, to win up front in the Big 10. And, um, you know, he's a smart guy, so he's going to have to, uh, I think, make some adjustments in that area. At what point in the season do you think that weather starts to be a factor in the Big Ten? November. November. Yep. Yeah. So there you go. As so as, for most of the season, it's not a factor. Yeah. As soon as uh, you have to start putting pants on, um, it starts to affect you. <laughs> so yeah, but my, it's the part it's the part of the season that determines everything. Yeah, but my point is, what games do we see in the bit? This is not the NFL where they're playing, you know, regular season games into January, and you see a lot of weather games in the NFL. Tons of weather games in 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 the Big Ten. Yes, absolutely. Does USC want to go to Nebraska or Wisconsin or Minnesota in the middle of November? No, they don't. They are going to be impacted. To Greg's point, at some point by the weather but i just don't think it's going to happen that often because number one i don't think so either i don't think the big ten will schedule them like that well yeah that's part of it so think of it number one they're playing half their games at home mm -hmm. so if you if you look at four weeks in november most likely they're going to play two at home so that knocks out two of the weeks and they play ucla they're going to play ucla the last week of the season yeah, every year yeah. so even when they got a get travel one, to one ucla there's another week cold weather game yeah. that knocks it out. So yeah. maybe, and you know, I've looked up the, the weather and, and I know Columbus, Ohio is probably the warmest of the big 10. Yeah. Probably yeah. the warmest, you know, whether it's Maryland or Ohio state, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not uncommon to see an Ohio state, Michigan game played in 60 degree weather. Every now and then. Yeah. I mean, 
half, uh, a few years ago, Nebraska Iowa game was was really warm too. Um, but that's just one time. Yeah, it's usually, it, it's usually horribly cold. <laughs> it will be fun to watch USC have to weather a game in Minneapolis or Madison, Wisconsin, in November. Yes, absolutely. It it's inevitable. It's going to hit them. Yep. But um, if their luck holds out, then it may be 50 or 55 most of the time when they have to play that one game yeah. on the road or maybe two in November in the Big Ten in November. And if they make it to the Big Ten title game, then that's inside. So that would yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. So. so not as big a factor as everybody thinks it is. Yeah, probably not when you, when you analyze it. I have the advantage of talking about this stuff like 42 hours a week on here between the, all these various shows. But so all this stuff comes up and i at some point get forced to think about it. Okay. Yeah. Are they really going to play in weather that much, which they will, but not maybe as much as people think. All right. All right. All right. Well, John, is there anything that uh, you has come across your plate this spring that, um, has stood out to you in regards to uh, guys like Greg that have reported out from uh, spring football practice or anything that's been said by Matt rule and the rest of the staff. Well, I think the most important thing he said was that Bryce Benhart is an NFL tackle. I mean, I, I have abused Bryce Benhart by name quite a bit. And I would love, I would love nothing more than to see Bryce Benhart uh, become a really good tackle. I, I just think it would be, that was the weakest part of Nebraska's entire football team, I think. And if they can coach those guys up on the offensive line to that level, I'm, I'm all for it. I think it'll be interesting to watch what happens with them. Is, who, would, who does the rankings? Like pro football talk or somebody like that that does the rankings for pro offensive line? Focus. focus, there you go. Yeah. And they, they continually rank, you know, our, our offensive line is terrible, especially last year in – you know, for that to turn around, I think would be enormous. Well, like you just said, when Matt Rule says that uh, one of the offensive linemen is a future NFL player for sure, then yeah, that is music to any Nebraska fans' ears because this offensive line has a lot of question marks. But Bryce just has to believe in himself. Oh. Yeah, I don't. I mean, last year when they anybody ran a twist or any kind of stunt against them, it's like the entire offensive line's brains just blew up on the field and they couldn't do anything. And you just wondered how much dysfunction there was going on with that staff and what they were being coached and what they were being uh, taught. And I guess not much from the looks of it. So we'll see what they do this year. I guess the other thing, there's a couple of other things he said. Uh, you know, on defense, what do you say? He's going to play 18 to 20 guys. I thought that was kind of interesting just because, I don't know, just get the eye for the future and building depth and stuff like that. And, I, you know, does that mean he's going to hand out 18 to 20 black shirts and everybody's going to freak out? And uh, I guess the other statement was recently about confidence that, Greg mentioned, you know, just everybody needs Nebraska needs confidence. And I think that that was a I tend to look at these things from more of a, a personnel standpoint. Most college football guys look at players and they look at them and they go their speed, their power, their strength, the way they run. I kind of look at programs from more from a, I guess, organizational standpoint. Do they do they look like they're confident? Do they look like they're know what they're doing. Do they look like they're hesitating on defense because they don't trust the defense? They don't trust their other teammates. Uh, you know, and a large part of that is because my regular job is it. And throughout my career, I've gone into a lot of companies to take over projects that were failing. And you have to go into those companies and look at the people and figure out who's really against you and who's really part of the team. Who are the champions that are standing up for this project? Who want, who do want who in their organization wants to succeed and quite frankly who who doesn't care at all so i think last year we really saw you know the end of the guy we fired's reign where it was pretty dysfunctional and 
you know, you had to wonder how much that affected all of the athleticism across that entire team or how much of the performance they put on the field. And I, that, that whole thing is exciting to see. I'm, I'm really, I plan on going to, uh, the spring game, you know, and I'm looking forward to just, I guess, being there. It's exciting. I don't really expect to like, you know, discover great things about Nebraska football. I expect to have a good time, you know. I want to yell, go Big Red at complete strangers. I just hope it's not <laughs> snowing. No. What? <laughs> Is it supposed to snow? You never know what's going on around here. Well, that's, that's true. It, it can snow one day and then be 80 the next day. You never know. <laughs> So, Greg, we just came through everything that John just talked about concerning Scott Frost. I'll say his name. John didn't. But uh, yeah. Scott Frost, who never heard of him. I, I was right. Well, we'll introduce you to him sometime when <laughs> Greg and I have probably said the name Scott Frost more than any other name in the last. Uh, I, I would think so for for we've been doing this show now for two plus years. Scott Frost has come out of our mouths more than any other name. There's no doubt about that. And we all thought he was going to be a good coach. I don't know anyone uh, that did not think that he was going to do the job when you put together what he did as a player at Nebraska, what he did at Oregon as yeah. an offensive coordinator, and what he did as a head coach at UCF. It all just added up to nothing but success. <laughs> yeah. And so we all thought that that was going to be successful. But maybe it was issues with details, or there's a lot of issues that that could have been uh put on the frost regime but as we move into matt rule i'm not selling matt rule as the next bear bryant or anything but i do think he's a really good coach and i'll be surprised if we're looking at the same program three years from now so greg when we're sitting here three years from now <laughs> what would for you be a alive. successful yeah if, we, if we're still all around here three years from now what does success look like to you bowl game every year a competitive bowl game and you know being in the in the playoffs i mean i think every husker fan would say the same thing just be relevant again you know be, be up there mentioned in, in in the top tier teams that uh, have a chance to, uh, you know, compete for a championship. Obviously you got to start, start somewhere. So, I mean, being relevant in the big 10 first is what you got to do before you're relevant nationally again. How about you, John? Three years in, you know, I'd say, well, I would say that, uh, by then you should be competing for a big 10 West title every season, but the big 10 West will really, it won't exist in three years. Will it? Nope. <laughs> Have they, st I, you know, competing, let's say in the running for the being, running. Yeah. uh, for a big 10 title. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, not necessarily every year win or play in the championship game, but, uh, be in the running. And I think with the way that this league is, is, you know, going to look, I, you want to be in the top four or five teams. I mean, you're going to have Michigan, Ohio state, obviously are always going to be up there just because they're going to buy the best players and coaches. And I'd say Penn state's probably going to be up there and USC, UCLA, maybe, but Nebraska needs to be in that conversation all the time. I think after Matt rules three third year. Well, you got to think the way this conference has performed, expanding to a 12 team playoff, there's going to be about three teams from this conference, maybe four at times, but at least three teams from this conference are going to make the playoff going forward starting in 2024. So right. that's where you want to be. Exactly. Do you think it'll be much more like the NFL? You know what I mean? Where, like, when you look at the NFL, I'm not a Vikings guy, but I mean, they had a really good season and then they lost in the first round of the playoffs. Was that success? Is it good enough to make the playoffs for an NFL team to be I successful? Called it, I called it a successful season for them. Okay. I, is that, do you think that's what it'll look like in the future? If your team well, makes my, the playoffs? Well, then that team had the number one pick in the draft, but they traded it. So, you know, making the playoffs is a successful season. That's to me. <laughs> I think it depends on who you are and what the expectations are. If Alabama and Ohio State are losing first round playoff games, their fan bases That's are not, not no, going to be happy about that. Not. No, no. 
And I think what? I think it, I think that where this fan base is at, although very proud, I think they would be more than happy to make the first round of the college sure. football playoffs, win or lose. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, if that now if Nebraska would become Nebraska again and be losing first round playoff games ten years into it, then expectations change, and then you and then you we would hear and see yeah. the Nebraska of old, and the fans be like, "Okay, we cannot be losing first round playoff games." But I think we're a ways away from that. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be fun. Yeah. That's what I'm looking forward to and seeing what Matt rule can do with this team. And, and, and a very dynamic coaching staff, which I think speaks volumes. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you were listening earlier, John, but um, you keep hearing from the players that they're having fun and that all these coaches are just super impressive and, and care so much about their success, you know, trying to get everybody to, you know, to make the NFL at the next level. And um, it's just, it, it's just a different vibe around the team that, that I've never really seen before. Uh, quite frankly, um, maybe back under Bo Pelini at times, but yeah, it, it's a, uh, it's a really different uh, atmosphere completely, you know, in, in the football program right now. I mean, you got, yeah, I got you know, we heard from Garrett McGuire today, who's a 24 year old wide receivers coach. And, you know, Matt Rule even, you know, Matt Rule so talks so fondly of him and stuff. And uh, I mean, you know, other teams that recruit against Nebraska try to use that against them. It's like, you know, this guy's twenty four years old. Um, but that works in his favor. I mean, the players just love him and he is so knowledgeable. Um, he, he's a, always fired up and, and uh, just super enthusiastic. And um, it's just kind of cool to see that. And, and, and Coach Rule even said, you know, it's just, it'll change as soon as he you know, develops some NFL receivers, you know, then, then that attitude will change nationally. Uh, but, you know, that's something you got to deal with um, when, you, when you got young guys like that in, in these uh, high positions of power that, um, you know, Everybody's going to take their shots at you, but um, just super cool to see how loyal that all these players have become to these coaches in just a few weeks. I, I, you know, is uh, oh my god, I had a thought and it went away. That's what <laughs> happens when you're old. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who? How is anybody co- is recruiting against Nebraska? I mean, the wide receiver bit, like he's too young, he doesn't have any experience, he doesn't know what he's doing. Is that what they're saying or what? Well, yeah, I mean, like when Nebraska goes, you know, to recruit a kid and, you know, they go out there, go to the home or whatever, and then it's the schools that come in behind them that, that try to take their shots at, at the Nebraska coaches and say, yeah, you, you don't want to go play for a guy like that that's not proven or anything like that. But, you know what, he coached D.J. Moore last year. Um, he's pretty good, pretty darn good receiver, so – and and you got you know you got out of the transfer portal. Josh Joshua Fleeks from Baylor comes out of the transfer portal. You know who played for Matt Rule, who played for uh, for Garrett right, yeah. Choir. Um, and so he knows. You know, uh, Josh told us today that you know he knows him like a book. Um, so you know, and that's why he came here. He was gonna he was gonna go to Texas Tech, but then when when uh, Coach Rule hired. Coach McGuire, he's like, I'm coming to Nebraska. So, uh, huh. yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool dynamic. Folks, thanks for being here for another uh, Huskers live show. We come your way every Tuesday at 7 Eastern. That's 6 where it counts. They're in the heartland right there in uh, Omaha or Lincoln, either one, 45 minutes away. I think it covers both. So central time there. Six Central. We appreciate John being here. Greg's here every week, delivers for us 118 consecutive shows here. Uh, John, let us know what uh, what you're working on these days. Well, you know, it's this is the off season. I I think a lot of other people cover Nebraska football pretty well in the off season. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is do history videos on YouTube. I I, I I'm getting started with them. 
I'm not that great a video editor, but they are more of a long form. Uh, so I started with 1869. Now the next one out will be the 1905 year where, you know, it was the first real crisis in college football history. Uh, 18 players were killed, 137 seriously injured. The big story is that Teddy Roosevelt stepped in the game. That's really not the whole story, but, you know, I thought I do, I, I like history and I thought that I could become a better video editor and tell stories. So that's what I'm going to work on for a large part of this cool. off season. Were the players killed playing football? Well, that's just it. You know, I've just, I've written the script for the 1905 video. Here's the thing. Uh, some of them were, the game was extremely brutal, right? right. but uh, there's a lot of them that, for example, the papers would list the, the number of the players and how they died. So some of them would die of meningitis. Okay. Well, meningitis okay. is an infection. Right. You know, one, one kid was listed as having died because a weed went up his nose and penetrated his brain. <laughs> Which is a, re a really bizarre. A bad day. Uh, That's a bad day. <laughs> but they, there were a lot of them that died because they, you know, there was no antibiotics. Mm -hmm. you know, penicillin wasn't invented until 1928, so they'd get a cut or they'd get a scrape, and they'd they'd get an infection and die wow. of the infection. And if they were playing football, that was a sign to football. So a lot of it was, you know, yes, it was very nasty, and things were very. The game was extremely brutal, but. Not as many died directly from football as. It's interesting. Is, it, definitely. Yeah. I always found it interesting that Teddy Roosevelt, who otherwise is known as a pretty tough guy that, uh, you know, with all of that he had to endure through war and so forth, made statements about football being a brutal game and that something would have to be done about it. <laughs> well, he he grew up. He was very sickly as a youth. And he, one of the things he did, I mean, it's like, oh, come on, the movie, Tom Hanks, Gump, you know, how oh, he sure. was in the thing and he ran out of it. And then he, you know, I, that, what a terrible comparison. Anyway, Teddy Roosevelt was very sickly as a youth. So he wanted to stay active his whole life. And he really loved football. He didn't get a play at Harvard because he was nearsighted. But he, I think it was his nephew that was playing at Harvard in 1905. And he, and a lot of others, here's the interesting thing. You compare it to today, he and others were, co were concerned that people were becoming too namby-pamby because of the life of leisure and luxury they were leading. Mm. And he felt that football built character in young men to make them tough, which they ran 200 plays a game, and they ran them over and over and over. You played both sides. Right. You didn't have platoon football. Sure. You didn't have timeouts. Uh, the referees and officials really didn't call penalties a lot. I mean, it was nasty and you just ran on a mass over and over and over. So if you think about doing that, but uh, I think Teddy Roosevelt did, didn't complain about the just sheer violence of the game. He complained about the fact that the game was there was very clear evidence that players were coached to take out players on other teams. You know, it was the dirty play that he hated and the, uh, you know, to gain an unfair advantage, but that'll be the next video that I release here soon. I never thought about the inability to treat scrapes and wounds and punctures as being yet the death of these people. Unfortunately, yeah. back then, yeah. yes, just they would just die just brutal deaths because yep. of all of that. I always thought it was just head injuries. They didn't have headgear. They get kicked <laughs> in the head. That's there was I a figured. lot of that. There was a lot of, uh, you know, cerebral hemorrhage, uh, abscesses on the brain, oh. uh, a lot of head injuries. I. Uh, eyes, a couple of players eyes. died from like broken ribs where it pierced their heart. Uh, Probably they, long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They yeah. averaged the, the life expectancy in 1905. Now, come on, just guess what the life expectancy for a male in 1905 was. What's it right now? Like 77? Ah. It's like, yeah, seven. Something I, like something that. In, I'm going to guess it was like 43. That's close. Hey, my grandpa was born in 1899, and he died in 2000. So, he's Ooh, good for him. <laughs> the The life expectancy was 47. Wow! Nice. See, my grandpa so that, doubled that, it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did a great job. 
<laughs> but that's yeah. what I hope to work on this off season. Just, we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's cool stuff. That is really interesting. And of course, uh, John mentioned 1869. That would be the first year of college football. And of course, Rutgers, yeah. the winner of the first game. They don't win too many games now, but they did win no. the first game then. And they got that going for them, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good okay. stuff. John, we appreciate you stopping by. Yep. I'll, I'll hopefully I'll see you guys again. Thanks so much, John. The John Coordination, check it out, folks. SB Nation. Thanks, John. Take Have care. All right. Yeah, it's it was just another uh, another life back then, just a completely different world. For yeah. sure. In some ways better, some ways worse. Uh, but certainly not more uh luxurious <laughs> than what we have it. My goodness. All right. Uh, don't see any other comments or questions, folks. I think we've uh, pretty much wrapped it up, I believe. Unless there's anything else, Greg, you wanted to hit on. So I'll keep your eye on, you know, uh, the transfer portal opens up on Saturday. Oh, uh, yeah. For a two-week two week open transfer portal period. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, moving and shaking across the, na the nation. And Yes. Uh, Coach Rule doesn't know of anybody – that uh, would be leaving. Um, he does wish that uh, this didn't happen before they played their spring game. Um, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, it, it, it usually is inevitable that, that somebody finds out where they're at and wants to make a change. But, um, you know, he has that talk with the team after spring ball is over. So mm -hmm. um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So I'm almost positive that the transfer portal did not open until May 1st last year, which made total sense to me because everybody's played their spring game by then. Mm -hmm. I just saw it the other day. Yeah. April 15th. And I was kind of surprised by that because my thought was there are going to be more teams playing on April 15th than any other time. Like Nebraska's playing, Ohio state's playing, Georgia's playing just tons of teams across the nation. Okay. We still have another week of, uh, well, not Nebraska's playing on the 22nd. Got it. But anyway, there's a ton of teams playing on the 15th and then a lot of teams on the 22nd. Then the 29th, there's still some teams that are going to play and then everybody's going to be done. Why would they have the transfer portal open before teams are done with spring practice? No clue. I just don't think it was very well thought out. I don't no, know. It's <laughs> not. Yeah. It's but not. That's just, I mean, it definitely, though, is you know, not just affecting Nebraska, it's going to affect everybody across the country. So yeah, with all, I mean, with all those names that are in the transfer portal already as well. So, uh, and I think Zoe agrees with us that it was not well thought out. No, she just has one thing on her mind. All right. Yeah. It's dinner time. Have you been treating her right these days? Yeah, best we can, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> all right. All right, folks, make it on back next Tuesday. We will uh, set you up for the spring game with our spring game preview with Greg. In the meantime, Husker Online right here on YouTube. You can catch uh, all of Greg's uh, press conference clips and practice good stuff there. So check it out, Husker Online right here on YouTube. And um, if you have not caught our conversation with Adam Carricker and also with uh, Greg Sharp, check those out right here on our Nebraska channel. Greg? We always appreciate it, sir. Yep. Always See you fun. Next week. Yep. Sounds good. Take care.